Hello, this is Mike Rose with CoStar Video. How are you doing today? I would like to welcome everybody to um, this webinar. We've got a uh, pretty exciting topic for those of you that uh, are commonly using tools and uh, to figure length of recording and things like that. So we are going to be going through the tools that are provided on the CoStar website. So we're going to break this down into several parts today and got a lot of uh, hopefully exciting things for those of you that are that have an interest in uh, using all sorts of different tools. Now, throughout the duration of this presentation, this will be in mute or listen only mode on your part just to keep the background noise out so that we can uh, make sure that we have um, that everybody can hear clearly and there will be opportunities for questions and there is an area on your dashboard for this go to webinar that is called questions so if you'll find that box for me there will be a place in there where you can type in a question and once you find that box just give me the name of the city that you're calling from type that in send it across to me then I can make sure that you can hear me and that we can uh, communicate yep okay great we're coming across perfect all right and uh, again Mike Rose vice president of sales for CoStar marketing I this is my 12th year going on 13 years here at CoStar so I've been here a long time I've seen the company grow um, substantially over the last few years and one of the things, the best kept secrets of CoStar, in my opinion, is the these tools that are available on our website. A lot of times, and we still do it as a service when you want to know how long it's going to take to record this long with this much hard drive, things like that. It's still, we, we often do those things for you or, you know, for, for customers. However, if there's ever a time that you want to be able to look at it, get online and quickly come up with some answers to some of your questions and I'm going to talk you through and take you through some uh, of those tools but first for those of you that aren't familiar with CoStar and I just mentioned that the phenomenal growth over the last few years um, CoStar is now a family of companies uh, for those of you that have started with us back in the day when we were just CoStar um, actually, now we are made up of several companies. CoStar Technologies, Inc. is our parent company. And under that, there is the CoStar Video Systems, the company that you're all familiar with that we promote and sell the CoStar brand, security, surveillance, and so on. And we have recently acquired Aircont Vision, for those of you that are familiar with their product line, very high-end um, camera manufacturer um, of very unique products, multi-headed cameras, uh, very high megapixel cameras. So we're very excited to have these guys a part of the family. And uh, if you have questions or need more information about the Aircomp Vision, uh, my contact information will be at the end of this presentation. So I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. Or if I can't answer it, then I will get you the answers and uh, be able to get you a reply back. We also have Cohu HD, which has been a part of the family for several years now. And for that for that division, they are a the premier manufacturer of traffic cameras and um, critical infrastructure. Very uh, very rugged and environmentally protected cameras. So they they are great part of the family as well. We also have our friends at Inatech, a solution provider for retail. They do a lot of unique retail solutions such as public view monitors and uh, a lot of uh, of your retail focused. And IVS Imaging, finally, is the company that has been with CoStar the longest. This company is a distributor of most of your name brand Machine vision cameras, such as Sony, Hitachi, Panasonic, and the like. Uh, machine vision, robotics, uh, medical vision, things of that nature. These guys specialize in providing solutions in that market space. So 
those are the companies of CoStar as we know them today. If there's any of these that you want to know more information about, I'd be happy to provide it at the end of the presentation, all my contact information. But um, just want to let you know that uh, we have a lot of growth and a lot of exciting things happening here at CoStar. Now, to the point at hand, the CoStar resources tab and the calculators. For those of you that are familiar with our website, um, this is the the tools that we have posted on our website. What I'm going to do today under this right here, resources tab. Anytime you want access to these tools, all you have to do is push that resource button, click calculators, and it will take you to this home page. Once you are here, let me just, I want to check one thing real quick, make sure that, okay, just want to make sure it was keeping up with me. This page right here, we're going to actually focus on three parts of this calculator, the most common parts. The first thing we're going to look at today is we're going to do the lens calculator. Great tool for those difficult shots, long range shots, things like that, that will help you determine which camera optics meet the needs and for the shot that you're wanting to take. Then next we're going to go into the NVR and the ET series storage calculator. Now it's not only storage, it is actually megabit, megabits per second throughput, things like that can be answered in that this calculator as well. And then last but not least, we're going to look at the mount configurator. For those of you that are often wondering which mount goes with which camera and you know which pole mount with this, this will help make sure that you are matching up the parts uh, that go together. So these are going to be the area of focus today. We, if time allows, we may look at the wire gauge. Some of these are, I will consider these old school stuff. This is the DVR calculator, as well as the wire gauge chart, with most everything now being IP, uh, POE. Th these are not as relevant as they once were. But let's go ahead and, and jump into the lens calculator. This is a very helpful tool. I find myself using it uh, on occasion when I get into some difficult uh, applications. So I know there's been a time, if anybody is an estimator or has put together projects, you've been in a situation like this where you've asked yourself or been asked that these in gates and out gates, I need to have coverage of these gates. Um, now, it's not always easy because you're going to have a distance. So in this case, let's say that we have a situation where we've got a gate that's 12 foot wide. The closest that we can get to that gate for a mounting spot with power is, in this case, let's say 35 foot away. And the ultimate view is needs to have coverage like this. So these things come up from time to time. And most of the time we know with a varifocal lens that we're going to get the shot we need because we're going to be able to zoom in and zoom out. But now when we're dealing with 10, 20, 30, 40 foot away from a target, then we could spend half a day mounting a camera just to find out that the shot is too wide. So with that being said, I want to show you the tools that we have online that would help answer this question and tell you exactly what millimeter lens you would need for this. Now, when you select the lens calculator, this screen will come up. This is what you have to work with. And there's just some very simple questions that you have to answer. And I'm going to walk you through each and every stage of that. The most important or the one that's not going to be the easiest to answer is going to be the size of the CCD. That will make a determination of how wide of a shot you're going to get. So this will be a pretty precise calculation. It's going to tell you um, to the millimeter what lens you're going to need. Then we're going to talk about the distance and the other things. But let's start with this where we go to get this information on the chip size. On the back of most spec sheets, and I would I would venture to say every should, if they don't have it on there, then this is a critical piece of information that you're going to need. And it's, it's on their website if it's not on the spec sheet. But this is one of those numbers of all of the calculations on the back of a spec sheet. 
is it will be buried inside here and it's just simply referred to as the image sensor. So in this case, we've got a one third inch CMOS. On this spec sheet, I got a one over 2.9. That's the fraction I need in order to start the calculator. Everything else I'll have from my notes from the job site. I'll have the, the ranges, distances and whatnot. So once you have that number, you now can start the, the formulas. So we've got that number. Let's in this calculation, let's say we have a one over 2.8 is the size of the camera we're considering. We know that the 12 foot calculation is the horizontal. So that's going to be the cross ways. So we've got a horizontal. You could also do it by vertical or diagonal. And down here at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the height, width, and diagonal just as a reference. Distance is this line right here, distance to target. In our case, we knew that was 35 foot. So we've got that answered. From there, now this is one thing that doesn't really stand out and it's, a, it's something that we will probably need to improve on the website. It's, it's not intuitive, but this little slider right here will slide back and forth along this line. This will make your adjustments so that you can dial in over here in this area. So I can figure my width. This will automatically fill itself in as you move this slider bar back and forth. So I knew that I needed a 12 foot width across. And this number right here will change as this slider bar changes. So I know for that calculation, I need a 15.5 millimeter lens, which is a good thing I did the calculations because most IP cameras are gonna go from a 2.8 to 12. So I would not have been able to zoom in to the scene as tight as I wanted to with a traditional IP. So something like this might be a perfect target for a nine to 22 millimeter lens. So that, is a great what if calculator. What if I went to this lens and went in here? Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this live. I'm gonna bring the side up here and we are going to just, I'm gonna go through that same scenario so you can see it in action. Here's my resources. I'm gonna hit my calculators. I'm gonna hit my lens calculator. And here is what we were looking at. I'm just gonna go through it live and show you that in this case, we had a one over 2.8. We know that it was horizontal that we wanted. I'm gonna type in my 35 foot. And this, here's the slider bar where I was telling you it was a little difficult to see. It's, it's right here, as you can see, with my lens being a 1.8 millimeter, I've got a width here of 103. I'm gonna slide this bar over and we stopped at 12. So I'm gonna slide this over. I'm gonna stop right at 12. And there is my 15.4. We didn't stop right exactly perfect, but 15.5, 15.4 was the calculation. So if I needed, say the camera that I was thinking about using was only a 12, you can just, you can take this slider bar back Well, let's see here. I don't want to connect it there. I want it here. And I'm going to. Well, let me slide this up. Let me slide this back here. Maybe I can answer that question. I don't know what I did. I pushed something incorrectly so I'm just once you get through with one calculation just so you know if you hit your refresh button on your browser it refreshes it so I'm going to go back to my 1 over 2.8 I'm going to go back to my 35 I'm going to jump down here and I'm going to take this to a 12 millimeter that's so I'm going to stop at the upper limit of the camera so a basic camera is 12 millimeter so I'm gonna get a 15.6 foot width. That may be acceptable. Give you a little bit of, of on each end, but if you were pressed by the customer to get a tighter shot, you're not gonna have any room to make that shot. 
So sometimes we'll take and do a screenshot of this. We'll post it in the document. Gives you some ability to um, look at um, the detail inside the proposal. So if there's ever a question going back after the job's done, you'll be able to uh, reference back to this. Okay, so that's the lens calculator. Very good tool, and it's one of those things that you don't need that often, but when you do need it, it's nice to have it. So, and anyone has any questions as we go through this, wants me to elaborate, we have the three sections, so I think everyone's probably on, is okay with that calculator. I'm gonna move on to the next section, which is gonna be the most comprehensive. This one is, um, the length of recording calculator. And it is a little bit more in depth. There's a lot of information that we have to have. But I'm often asked the question, and it's it's asked in a way of, with, with no information, just basically give me a 16 channel recorder with 30 days of storage. Okay, makes sense, we can do that. But I would, if with given that question, I would be dictating a lot of things for you, like how many images per second you're going to be using. And there's really four questions that you need to be able to answer in order to fill out the calculator and give meaningful data. Those, the, the four questions are first, you've got to know whether it's motion, continuous, or a combination of the two. So in this example, we're gonna build this calculator based on 12 hours of motion only recording and then 12 hours of continuous recording. So our first calculation is gonna be that. Now, in our case with a CoStar recorder, motion can be done independently. So I could set up so that we call it event or motion recording. I can also do continuous recording independently from motion, meaning that it's gonna record a certain amount of frames regardless of any activity that's in the screen. Or I can do a combination of the two that says, give me one image per second for 24 hours, seven days a week, but anytime motion occurs, bump the motion up to five images per second and then stop after it doesn't see motion for 30 seconds. So those things can all be variables, but in this exercise we're gonna do, we're gonna separate the two for 12 and 12. Images per second, it's key, because it makes a huge difference if I've got 30 images versus five. I can rarely make a case for a recorder to record at 30 images per second. I, I don't, there's very, very few that would require that type of recording. Normally, the sweet spot is around five images per second uh, on motion or three, two, three on continuous. But on this exercise, we're gonna do five in motion and we're gonna do two in continuous. The next question, and this is a swag, there's, this is not scientific by any stretch. It's just, you have to decide what the percentage of motion will occur throughout its recording time. So in a busy, busy outlet, I would say 50%. If it was 100%, you might as well record continuously. So half is a good starting point. If it's a office building where there's not a lot of motion maybe in the lobby, you could drop that down to 10 or 20, 30%. But that is a swag at best. You just gotta kinda, you gotta just eyeball it and come up with a percentage. And then the resolution. Is this gonna be a two megapixel, three megapixel, four, five, 10 megapixel, whatever it's gonna be, you have to know what resolution. So once I know these four answers, I can now proceed to the calculator and I can do a lot of what if scenarios. So what if I went to one more image per second? What if I had less motion? What if, and so what if is really the key of this, this calculator. So keeping these things in mind, when you click on the INEX or ET recorder on the website, this screen is gonna pop up. And now it's just a fill in the blank. It's, it's very simple once, once you go through this. And once you see me do this, it'll make sense and be easy for you to populate. First thing we gotta know is what recorder 
and typically this is going to be, you know, once you've consulted with the customer and is this going to be HG over coax? Is it going to be IP? Is this going to be um, 16, 32, 64 channels? In this scenario, we're going to use a 3220 XDI. So the pull down underneath the model will give you all the CoStar options. You just pick the one you want. To the right of that, you're going to see what's called channel allocation optimization. A big word for uh, very simple. What this means is that anything with the 20 series or higher means that I can put a full 32 cameras on this box and the box will recalibrate the throughput and make sure that I can record um, at my maximum allowed amount for the resources that I have. You know, what that means, in the past, if I had a 3210 XDI, I wanted to put 32 cameras on it. Well, anything over two megapixel, the box itself would say, wait a minute, I can't guarantee you that I'm going to give you 30 frames per second for all 32 of these cameras. So in, instead, I'm just going to reduce the number that you can put on this box. So the problem was, is we all know no one does 30 images per second. No one is maximizing the cameras. So instead of maximizing or giving me the option to go to 30, why not let me run it at 10 where I want to actually run it and just give me my channels back. So if this recorder supports the allocation optimization, then this box will automatically check for you. So if you pick a model and this is not checked, anything that has the 20 right before the XDI 20 series, all of these boxes support this channel optimization. So that's what that means if you see it. From there, now we pick the number or the part number of the camera. The reason we do this and not just give you a two megapixel, three megapixel is I can build this out for multiple cameras. So if I'm building this quote out and I want to use this in the future, I only may have 10 of these type and maybe I have some bullets and I have some domes. I can continually add to the list and keep the part numbers all the same or different for each model that I'm adding to the quote. So in this case, we're just going to use the one, one model. I simply put in the number of cameras that I'm going to use. In this case, we're going to use 32. And once I get to that point, I need to go into this open detail setting. This box right here is my first stop. If you just insert the camera and skip this step, it's going to put the camera in there at full 30 images per second, very highest resolution. It's going to have it already maxed out to its fullest if you just insert the camera. So I can't think of a reason you'd ever want to do that. So you need to push this button first before you go to insert the camera. All right, when we push that button, well, let me go to this screen. Once I push the first button, this video profile screen pops up. A lot of numbers here, but believe me, it's, it's really not that difficult. The main thing that you need to worry about changing is the first check you have right here is use intelligent codec. What this means is this turbocharges your compression for long-term storage. The camera that we have chosen is already H.265, so we're already gaining compression based on the codec, the H.265. So maybe that has given us 50% greater storage. Well, if I use the intelligent codec, which even adds more compression and more smart algorithms that will even compress the video down further. So you will notice a, quite a difference between checking this box and not checking this box. If the camera you chose has the option, this box will be active. You can just click that. Maybe you want to run it with and without, but for the most part, I like to use it. You might as well uh, maximize the amount of storage you're using. So you can check that box. From there, I have a choice of my resolution. Now, the calculator is smart enough to know that if I chose a two megapixel camera, it's not going to let me pick five megapixel resolution. So this will be at its highest 
possible if you wanted to dumb it down for some reason. But most of the time, you don't have to do anything with this box. You do have to choose your frame rate. This makes all the difference in the world because that box will be defaulted to 30. So you have to make the change at this point. Now, on our first piece of information we collected, remember we said for time lapse, we're gonna do two images per second. And on motion or slash events, we were gonna do five images per second. All right? so. We fill that in. I've got my two images per second. On events, same thing. My resolution is going to stay the same, and I'm going to put five in here. The next place that you have to choose is this standard. There's four modes of video quality that you can choose. Very high, high, standard, basic. Very high, then there's almost a doubling effect between these different. So I like to start at standard. Put standard in you're gonna have the ability to go up to high or very high on the calculations, or you could even go down. So um, I like to go standard at most high, and then I've got the ability to go very high. And this is the quality of the compression that you put on the video. So um, don't go max out unless you really have a need to see extreme resolution at, um, uh, what you're recording so go to standard or high on that and you're going to start to see what bandwidth you're going to be required for this recording so this will change interactively as you change these numbers right here your bandwidth will change okay we're almost there here is our event ratio this is that 50 percent that we took the swag at so we're going to say half of the time when we're in motion recording that we will have motion that's probably pretty high but we're gonna play it safe and put 50. Now, these four boxes, if I'm doing time-lapse and event combined, then I just put 24 hours here. But in our example, we're gonna do half of, we're gonna do 12 hours of time-lapse and we're gonna do 12 hours of event. So when this equals 24, we know we're done. So there we've entered our information we've answered all the questions that we had and that's basically it everything down here below is your live video profile this has no effect on the recording this is only what you would be streaming remotely so when we get over to the calculator and we hit close here it's going to put us back to our other screen and we are going to hit insert the camera and this line will appear. So we've inserted the camera. All of a sudden, this line appears and it's given us our stats. Recording, I'm gonna use throughput of 20.64 megabits per second. If I'm looking at all these cameras, my live is gonna be 34 megabits remote and my total is 71 megabits per second. Now. If you decide, well, that's not gonna work, I need to change it, you do have your edit, you can take it off or I can copy it. So here, these tools right here allow you to go back in and make your changes to that scenario. So now I go down here to my recordable time link. I can do give it two pieces of information. Let me, I'm gonna click forward here. So, all right. I can put in the storage that I have available. So let's say I only had a one terabyte machine. I can put in the one terabyte and it's gonna tell me what I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get 4.7 days or six tenths of a week or this many hours. Or I can say, I wanna do 60 days. Tell me how many terabytes I'm gonna need. So you've got these two pieces of information that you can play with. So. Tell it what you got or tell it what you want and it'll tell you what you need. So that will spit out a number here or here. Oh, didn't want to go there. So now I'm going to, we're going to go onto the calculator and actually do this live so you can see it in action. Let me slide over my screen again. All right. I'm gonna to go to my calculators right here. Here's my screen. Let me just maximize this. All right, in this last example, 
we were using a 3220. So I'm going to pull this down and you'll see all the model numbers. I'm going to go to my 3220 XDI. It supports the channel allocation, so it's checked. So it tells you that it's checked. The model of camera, I'm going to use a 2 megapixel that's H.265. So to crack the code for everybody, if the starting number after the CDI, that's a 2, 1. If you go to a 2, 5, that is H.265. So this one right here is an H.265 camera. I'm going to select that. I'm going to put in my 32 cameras that I wanted. I'm going to hit my detail setting. I know that I'm going to use this resolution. Just like I said earlier, these are defaulted to 30. That would be way, way, way overkill. So I'm just going to pull this down and go to time lapse of two. And I'm going to go to event or motion. I'm going to go to five. I'm going to reduce these down. So you'll watch the bandwidth change as I change these. I'm just going to go to standard and standard. So that reduces my bandwidth through, but I still have room for improvement on the box if I want to up that. Here's my event ratio. I'm going to do 50%. Right now, defaulted out of the box is going to be a time lapse. So you don't want that going on. So I'm going to go 12 here and I'm going to do 12 here. So now I've equaled my 24. If I wanted to do time and event, I could put 24 hours in right here. And it will take these two out and give me my 24. So this is the most commonly used time lapse and event. It's very efficient, a very good way of maximizing and making sure you at least have something recorded. And it not only gives you good video when motion occurs, but it also marks your events on your video bar through your playback. So I can see where motion occurred throughout the night and I can just go back to those spots. But just to keep it consistent, I'm gonna go back here to 12 and 12. That's all I have to do, hit close. Now I'm ready to insert it into my calculation. So I hit the calculation. There I go. It's giving me my 32. It's giving me my recording live. Now here is, I'm going to answer two questions. I'm going to say, well, if I had 12 terabytes in this box, how many months can I get? The answer is one and a half months based on 12 terabytes. Well, I'm going to go down here and say, whoa, I need 60 days not 45, so I'm gonna change this to days. And it's telling me I need 16.79. Now you can play with it. You could go back in and edit this and say, what if I take out one image per second on my motion? What's gonna, what will I do to change that? How can I tweak this? So this will give you a real time tool that you can use. Now I've used, I've got my full 32 in here. But if I wanted to build this out and go here and say, all right, give me a couple of these cameras, a couple of these, a couple of these, you can continually adding to this and add all those together. So if you had a five megapixel camera, a couple 4Ks and some 1080Ps, you could add those all together and it would still give you the same results down here at the bottom. It'll, it'll figure out what that's going to take. So, also a very powerful tool. It's being constantly updated, so as part numbers change, you may get in here in 30 days from now and find a new button. On the front of, if I go back to the calculator, oh, I'm gonna go back to the support page, the calculator page right here, there's a how-to guide. So that will, if you wanna go back and do a refresher, just click on the how-to guide and it will give you the PDF that'll just kind of talk you through what we just covered. So hopefully that helped clarify the, the tool. Some people probably didn't even know it was out there. We're gonna do our best to promote that and make sure that you know anyone that is doing quoting and putting systems together that you know that it's out there. All right, finally, 
let's go into our camera mount configurator. This one will keep you out of trouble big time because I hate it. And we try to do everything we can on our side to make sure that you get the right mount when you're on the job site with the right camera. And I'm sure there's nothing more frustrating than being on a job site when two pieces don't match. So this is a great way to validate what you need. So this is broken up into three sections here. There's always the camera, there's the mount, and then there's if there's a third mount that goes with it, such as a pole mount, corner mount, parapet, something along those lines, then it's going to let you just fill this out and build this out. For example, this is a pull down for all the camera models. So as you go through here and you find a, let's find a 2510 VIFW dome, it's going to pull up that camera. Now, what mounts do I have to choose from? You pull this down. Looks like I have a, a dome. I have a junction box, a pendant, and a wall mount. So I want to wall mount this. So here's the wall mount with its part number, and let's see if it has any other options. It does. I can pull or corner mount this, so I'm going to hit my corner mount adapter. Those are the three pieces that have been verified to fit together. Now, all you have to do is reset the, the page. It resets everything. Or well, actually, there's a reset button right here. Now, let's just say I've got to corner mount. I've got a... Uh, I need to use a mount, or I have this mount in my inventory. Let's say I have this PS10 mount. I have this mount. Well, which cameras go with that mount? Pull it down. It eliminates everything except for these models. So these five models will go with this mount. So I could say, all right, I want that dome with this mount. And let's see, is there any, there's no options available besides these two pieces. So obviously it's a pendant mount. You don't have a, can't pull mount it. So this also is a great way to just validate what you're trying to put together. What's a pop, let me look at a popular one here. Let's see, this is 26WM, it's a popular mount. That's one for a PTZ, that's the PTZ that goes with it. So these two will match up. Now make sure you read the notes down here at the bottom because sometimes it may refer to an accessory that you will need in order to make these two fit together. So just double check that and that will help. That's constantly being updated. So as new products come on board, we can put that in and uh, make sure that everything goes together as needed. And you can just reset that. All right, we got a couple minutes here. I wanna bring up, I'm gonna go back. There's a couple other calculators on here. I'm gonna go back to my resource and to my calculators. The DVR storage calculator works exactly like the one we just looked at with the XDI. So one notable thing is we did this with an IP camera on this storage calculator. It also includes the TVI or the ET series recorder. So if you're using up the coax or IP, it's both done in this calculator. If you're using an old recorder, just a DVR, like an E series, or an SP series, those would be done here um, in this storage calculator. This is just based on analog, this is based on IP. Now this wire gauge chart, this does have some validation with the HD over coax because there are still cable runs to power those up. This is just a great little cheat sheet. I've always had this close to me, especially back in the old days when we were always running Siamese cable. But if you know the total amps that your camera is going to take, and you know the gauge of wire you're going to be using, you can easily look at this. Most cameras by themselves are half a milliamp or um, an amp. So let's just use an amp. Most of the time it's 18 gauge wires, the most common at one amp. That means if I'm running, I got 24 and 12. If I'm running 24 volts, I've got 200 foot that I can run. If I'm doing 12 volts, I got 100. So if I'm using 16 gauge, then that doubles. So depending on the gauge, but most everything is 18. 
for those of you that have or know people that take the Cat 5 and bind three pairs together to run power across, that translates into about 21 gauge wire. So it doesn't even go that low. But when you're doing that, you can use the 20 is close enough, but you get about 75 to 150 foot when you're pairing up three of the four pairs inside of the Cat 5. So, you know, you can look at that and see. So that tool is always out there. If you ever get in a situation where you have to know that, just remember it's out there. Go take a look, and it'll help help keep you out of trouble. So that's the calculator page. Hopefully this was a good uh, refresher if you've used it in the past. If you haven't, hopefully you, you it made sense and gives you some more, more tools in your toolbox. Um, if there is a calculator that you would like to see, I'm going to put up my uh, contact information now. Um, for those of you that haven't spoke, we haven't spoken in the past, and you know, shoot me a note or call me directly on my extension, and uh, you know, let me know if you have questions. If you do have questions, now's a good time to type them in. I'll be on the line here as we wrap up, so I'll be happy to answer those. This was recorded. So this is a tool that we are going to make available on the website so that you can go out and refresh yourself on this if you need to. And you know, shoot me a note. If there's something you'd like to see that wasn't in the calculator or maybe a different calculator you'd like to see, then let me know that, and I'll be more than happy to uh, look into adding that to our website. So... For those of you that are going to be at GSX uh, the week after next, look us up. We're going to be there at the show. Uh, that's in Las Vegas, formerly the As Is. Now it's called the GSX Show. So, you know, look us up. Plan on coming by and, and seeing the, the new products and seeing us at the booth. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you for your time. Now, if you would, there's a questionnaire at the back end of this. When you log out, a questionnaire will pop up. Wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind answering the questions for us real quick, just lets us know how we're doing and any feedback that you have, I'd be happy to, uh, to take that into consideration. And enjoy the time today. Thank you for attending and uh, look forward to working with you in the future.